Good evening, everybody. I would like to call to order this hearing of the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, everyone, for coming and being here for this extra hearing. As you know, we're making up for last week when we got snowed out. And um, so today, our agenda is full of policy bills coming from the Department of Health. And um, the Department of Health is uh, very grateful to all of us. And um, many of the members here are, have uh, are authoring some of the bills for the agency and they're very appreciative. And so I have on my desk a box of cookies, which I'm gonna start over with Representative Nadeau and you can take and hand around and these are from MDH. So, oh yeah, sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh no, thank you. I'm sure no one's hungry at this time of the day. Can they just stay here? Uh, <laughs> Seems like yes. we're all bipartisan. Now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Representative Perryman, you're carrying some of the bills, so you deserve yeah, a cookie for I, I, sure. It's all about healthy. <laughs> it's all about healthy. That's yeah. right. That's right. These have got to be very healthy cookies, I'm sure. So, um, okay. So, first order of business is, as always, approval of the minutes of February 28th. Um, Representative Smith. Uh, I would move to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All right, thank you, Representative Smith. So, a uh, motion to approve the minutes of February 28th. Um, any discussion to the motion? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Okay. Moving right along. So the first bill that we're gonna take up today is House Bill 1465. Representative Cagle is here. And, um, and also, um, as I noted, these are all Department of Health bills. So if there's someone from the agency who can come down on each of the bills and just um, come and sit with the member and be ready to for explanation or questions, that would be great, and that would help us move things right along. So, and just so people can be, um, uh, understand the process here a little bit, the next bill that we have listed, House Bill 1329, Representative Carroll's bill, we're gonna hold on that because there's a testifier who isn't here yet. Turns it off. So just, we're gonna be out of order a little Turns bit, but. On. For right now, we're going to start with House File 1465. So the chair will move that, um, that House File 1465 be laid over for possible inclusion. And the, um, there is an A1 amendment, and I assume we should adopt that first. So the chair will move the A1 amendment to put the bill in the order in which the author would like to have it discussed. So all in favor of adoption of the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. And so Representative Cagle, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, this is the clarifying some of the administration around opiate antagonist drugs, um, naloxone, Narcan, um, and it is just changing who in schools can um, do this, and so changing it from a nurse to any other personnel employed by or under contract with a charter, public, or private school. The amendment just adds some clarifying language saying that um, we're not interfering in any of their other duties that we have, and so, um, you know, I just think about, um, uh, you know, this is my first time in front of this committee this year, and uh, I've come to, to this work through um, having a loved one who's been in recovery, and so I think about my brother and when he was in active use, and I thank God every day that um, he was just doing heroin and didn't have to deal with fentanyl <laughs> right now. And so I think, um, you know, fentanyl is a scary, sneaky drug. Um, and I um, think that we really need to make sure that we're arming everybody we can um, to make sure that we're saving lives if need be. And so um, my brother is clean now and been for a long time. And so um, I'm just really glad that I, I see my job as making sure that other families can get um, to the point that my family got to. So. 
All right. Thank you, Thank you very much, Representative Cagle. And um, I don't know if the, your agency partner here wants to speak or not. Or if, if you do, you have anything you want to add, um, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Chair Liebling, um, and thank you for bringing this bill. I don't have any additional comments, but happy to answer questions. My name's Karen Fogg with the Department of Health. All right, thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else in the audience who wants to testify on the bill? All right, seeing none, um, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing this forward. This is uh, this is an important it's an important bill. Um, the on, uh, naloxone and Narcan have saved numerous lives, um, and they've reduced ED visits and expanding the population that's trained in order to you know uh, provide them is super important. Um, the one question that I have is: Do we collect data on? Narcan um, administration in schools, and if we do, I mean, if we don't, can we? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll let my testifier answer that, um, but I think um, to some of the programs that I've um, seen in the schools, a lot of times Narcan is just handed out to folks. If they need it, they grab it, and so, um, you know, I don't know if students, where they're using that, but um, I'm sure the districts probably <laughs> have some reporting that they do if they have to administer. Okay, Ms. Fogg, mm -hmm. right? Um, thank you, Chair Liebling, and um, thank you, Representative. We do not collect information about Narcan use in schools at this time. Okay, Representative Nadeau. Thank you. Um, should we? And I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're just handing out Narcan. Number one, it's very expensive. Depending on the dosage, depending on the manufacturer, it can range from um, $40 uh, uh, a unit up to $2,000 a unit. Um, and so if we're just handing them out, how, how, do, how, how are schools going to afford these? And um, yeah, yeah I'm, I mean, should we? I mean, if, 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 if we're having... I would, I, how, should we be collecting data on distribution, especially now if we're just handing them out? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Nudo. I think that's um, one thing that we have been looking at, especially through the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council, um, looking at collecting some of that student data. Um, with the programs that I saw when they were handing out Nar Narcan, it was actually a mom who started a program and um, was paying for this out of her own pocket, giving it to students. Um, and so I'm not sure where, you know, where a lot of this is coming through grants and, and um, the, the folks that are on the ground doing this work, they're the ones distributing the Narcan to the schools. Okay, I think we have another test fire coming down who can maybe, it's the phone a friend. That's right. So, welcome to the committee and, and just please let us know who you are and go ahead and answer the question. Thank you, my name is Denise Herman. I am the state school health consultant in the Minnesota Department of Health. And just to, for a note of clarification, um, schools do not hand out Narcan. Um, it is a prescription medication currently, so you will need a prescription. You can, as a lay person, go to a pharmacy and get it. So many lay persons have it, but they've gotten it that way. So in the, in the intent in the schools is that they would carry this, stock it, so that in the event of an emergency, they would have it available and would be able to use it. All right. Much like you have an AED or something right. like that. And, and could you answer the data collection question at all? Yes, currently, as Karen said, we don't collect that at the state um, related to school use. And as you stated, many schools, however, do collect that internally or know in terms of their own emergency use, how often they have done that. Many, many schools have that kind of data collection um, internally at a local level. Okay, thank you. Representative Nadeau? And thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that clarification. Um, I hope moving forward that maybe we think about adding this and collecting it. Um, I know that in, in Hennepin County, um, we, do, we do collect this information and we do report on it. And Narcan, I mean, it's a, it's a great way to show the public how we are reducing ED visits, we are saving lives and uh, how vital it is. So I hope we can consider collecting that information um, moving forward. So thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you for clarifying my questions. Okay, Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question deals with um, current supply of Narcan in schools. Our 
Is there enough supply for that? Because now if we're going to allow other ones to administer it too, but <coughs> is there enough supply or is there a shortage or, or um, that's my question on the supply. It's a good idea, but if we aren't able to meet our current supply, then what's the plan so we meet? Because if more people see it, more people can administer it. It's just like the AEDs. When the more we have, the more people can use it. It's a good thing, but talk about the supply chain. Um, in just schools, not, do you have enough or what's this going to? Thank okay. you. Who's, whose question would that be? Uh, Ms. Fogg? Ms. <laughs> Fogg, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative. This bill does not address supply. It's, it just closes a current loophole between the Good Samaritan law and the other laws that protect um, individuals from liability. So currently, um, as, as you can see in the amended language, or in the um, recommended language that it referred to licensed school nurses and um, certified public health nurses, which do not encompass all um, health professionals that are working in school. So the full intent of this bill is to just limit, um, to close that loophole to allow uh, LPNs and other types of health professionals who provide health services in schools um, with the, the same coverage that both uh, that you and I have, but also um, other school health professionals currently have. Represent Packer. Thank you. Yeah, we're on the same page. It was just more of a general question with your if we have enough supply in the current situation right now. That that's that was the general question. All right, um, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I I wasn't going to ask a question, but based on what you just said, you talked about. Um, other health professionals working in the school. And I'm wondering if that is your intention, because that's not what the language says. The language says a nurse or any other personnel employed by or under contract with charter public or private school. And so I'm wondering if that needs to be cleaned up to ensure that it is health professionals, or do you really intend for this to apply to any professional in the school? Ms. Herman. <laughs> Here, maybe I should be. <laughs> and and did I get your name right? Was it Herman? Herman, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N. -R -R -N -N, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. The um, healthcare professional, we wanted to, the, the Good Samaritan specifically calls out the non-healthcare professionals. Okay. And this loophole was because we had two kinds of nurses. Um, that were only listed when we have multiple kinds. And then adding any other staff seems from what we have gathered in talking to the Department of Ed, to others at Health, the Board of Nursing covers anybody should the district decide that in our district, we are going to have our school counselors fill this role. Or in our district, it will be the school social workers or whomever they decided would then be covered because a school social worker technically is a, probably a non-healthcare professional because they're not licensed like a nurse. So I think that anyone would be covered. Is that as the intent anyway? Representative Brindley. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, to, to be honest, that actually raises some questions for me because everyone else listed um, in subdivision 12 would probably have some level of medical training, certainly an emergency medical responder, police officer, correctional employees, they are often also um, trained, certainly community-based health disease prevention, firefighters, they all have some level of first responder training um, and, and that would not necessarily apply to quote, any other personnel employed by the school. Um, and that, that gives me pause um, because it doesn't really fit in with the rest of this subdivision. So that gives me pause and a little bit of concern that we might want to uh, define that a little bit more specifically um, moving forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, Representative Cagle. Madam Chair, and I think if you um, read a little bit further, um, 
you know, on the other page, it talks about um, licensed physician, licensed assistant, but then also individual has training in the recognition of signs and opiate overdoses and use of opiate antagonists as part of emergency response to opiate overdose. So these, um, you know, we're training folks on how to use the Narcan and then how to administer it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rest of the bill kind of goes into that a little bit. Okay, uh, any other discussion? All right, with that, House File 1465 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much, Representative Cagle, and thank you, testifiers. All right, so we are gonna take up the next bill, House File 1329, Representative Carroll. I understand your testifier is here. So. So Representative Carroll, is, uh, your motion is that House File 1329 be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee, right? Correct. All right, Adam. and so that's Representative Carroll's motion. And then there is an A1 amendment to put the bill in its intended form. And um, Representative Carroll, I assume you want to adopt that right away. Correct. Right, so Representative it. Carroll's moving the A1 amendment. Um, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. So Representative Carroll, to your bill as amended. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and members. Um, this is the uh, strengthening the Minnesota cancer reporting system. And what's the purpose of it? It's to ensure that Minnesota Cancer Reporting System complies with the National Program of Cancer Registry's requirement of participating in the National Interstate Data Exchange Agreement and therefore assure that the reporting system will continue to receive $840,000 in annual CDC funding. It also strengthens the cancer data completeness of Minnesota and other state-based cancer reporting systems by reciprocal sharing of non-resident cancer information between respective state-based carrier reporting systems. For example, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin. It also clarifies Minnesota Statute 144.69 to improve the efficiency of the reporting system. Why is this important? And, and Representative Carroll, if you could, I think you're a victim of our soft mic. Oh. If you could just angle it, maybe it can maybe get, it's pick you up better. Also, I've heard I have a soft voice. That's great, right there. Although my, <laughs> my children would beg to differ at various times. So why is this important? Minnesota is the only state not participating in the National Interstate Data Exchange Agreement. It's a requirement for CDC funding. Minnesota is at risk of losing its annual $840,000 uh, in federal funding for the reporting system. The, um, it's a reciprocal agreement allowing state-based cancer reporting systems to share non-resident cancer information with neighboring state-based cancer reporting systems. It's important to increase the completeness of cancer information on Minnesota residents and therefore have more accurate and valid information for Minnesota cancer reports and investigations of cancer concerns. If Minnesota is not in compliance and cannot sustain it, then the $74 million per year in research funding received by Minnesota's two uh, National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive care centers, which is the University of Minnesota Masonic Cancer Center and Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, may be at risk since um, as these centers rely on accurate state-based cancer reporting information to reflect the catchment areas and associated research. And um, I'll stop now. I have uh, a testifier here if uh, he wants to add anything. All right, welcome to the committee. If you would just come close to the mic so we can hear you. They're, they're not so great. And uh, just give us your name and your affiliation and please go ahead and and make your comments. Sure, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee, my name is Jay Desai, and I'm with the Department of Health. I'm uh, the director of the Cancer Reporting System. And um, really the language here, uh, as Representative Carroll said, as one of the key things is allowing us to participate in the uh, interstate data exchange. So where we get data on um, 
people who are not Minnesota residents but who get diagnosed with cancer in Minnesota were able to share that information with the state that they are a resident with uh, so that they can have more complete and accurate information for their systems and then they also <coughs> do the same thing reciprocate with us uh, for Minnesota residents who are diagnosed in other states. Currently that data is not shared on our part um, and we often don't also get data from Minnesota residents from other states. So we're trying to close that loophole. It's a, and that is a requirement from our CDC funding. So we're trying to comply with that requirement. <clears throat> um, two other pieces, we're just trying to clean up a little bit. Be clear, we do uh, on an annual basis provide the data that we collect here in Minnesota to the CDC and to the National Association of Cancer Registries. But when we do that, we don't provide any information on identifiers, right? No names, social security, address, numbers. So just want to be clear in the language what we do provide and what we don't provide when we share that data nationally. Uh, and then the third piece of this is we currently have um, for um, there are often opportunities to participate in epidemiologic investigations or research for some of uh, our cancer patients and cancer survivors. And when there are opportunities to do that, in statute there's a way that <clears throat> we are, um, can communicate that information to the patient so that they have the chance to participate and know what's going on and can consent to participate in those activities. Um, and so following both federal human subjects regulations and Minnesota data privacy regulations, currently we have to find the provider and get consent and then the provider can give consent and then let us also let the patient know. Um, what we're trying to do is change that so that we can directly contact the patient and let them know that there's this opportunity. They still have to give consent, still have to follow all the federal regulations and we would then notify the provider that this is going on so they wouldn't have to first get consent from the provider. Uh, so sort of uh, let the patient make that decision directly instead of going through the provider. So, and that's only for these particular studies that are coming up that are related to research and research opportunities. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we do have another testifier who has signed up, uh, Natasha Cher Chernyavsky. You would come down. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Good evening. My name is Natasha Chernyavsky, and I'm the Legislative and Policy Specialist for Citizens Council for Health Freedom. And today I'm here. Um, I've talked with Representative Carroll the, over the past couple of days about this bill and our concerns for patient consent um, in the data sharing and data collection. Um, I haven't been able to see the A1 amendment, so I'm going to speak to the bill as it was introduced. However, I would just like to um, state that when we look at the actual language, there's no provision for patient consent. And I know that the previous testifier said there's a process for it, but when we look at the statute in law, um, there's not anything that's, that's um, stated or outlined to um, note that the patient has this consent before they're, they're contacted by a researcher, before their data is collected in the cancer surveillance system. And so we have uh, a lot of concerns over the um, potential for, for just um, complete um, ignoring of their of their consent and when we look at this issue at the potential for that data to then be shared outside with other states that this is really a huge privacy concern um, and we understand that when it goes to the federal government that there's a de-identification process and that that is in the language however we still think there should be patient consent for that data to go to the CDC um, or, or any other federal agency because it is still the patients um, their, their data their ownership and that that shouldn't disappear just because they have a disease just because they have cancer. Um, secondly, when we look at the provision in lines um, 1.18 and 1.19, or starting on the subdivision two, about sharing um, non Minnesota residents data um, outside of the state. Last year when this bill was introduced, it was for personal identi personally identifiable data of Minnesota residents to be um, allowed to go to other states. And so when we look at this, we really think this is a bit of a slippery slope of allowing other states to reach into Minnesota's um, surveillance system and have access to patient data in there. And that eventually, you know, right now it is just asking for non-Minnesota residents, but that eventually this could be Minnesota residents, personally identifiable information shared with other states 
um, and their registries without patient consent. And so what we would really ask for changes in this bill, and I, I've talked with Representative Carroll about this, but we'd love to bring it forward to the committee, is that there would be patient consent put into both um, both uh, under subdivision to both of those data sharing um, uh, requests, that there would be express written patient consent before non-Minnesota resident data is given to statewide registry of another state, and then also for express written consent of patients before their de-identified data is given to the CDC. And so we'd love to um, have your consideration of that ask. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience? Oh, okay, so there is another testifier, I guess. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and go ahead with your testimony. Yes. I'm Logan Spector. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School as well as a member of the Masonic uh, Cancer Center. Um, and I'm testifying in um, support of this bill um, for a number of reasons. I am a childhood cancer researcher um, and uh, need to access data on these rare cancers across uh, the United States and indeed internationally in order to aggregate enough uh, cases in order to understand the causes of childhood cancer. Um, and we really cannot do it without this uh, interstate sharing provision. Um, frankly, it's uh, um, a no-brainer because uh, 49 other states, which are just as concerned with privacy as Minnesota, have done it. Um, and uh, so far as I know, there's never been a breach of uh, privacy uh, resulting from this sharing. Um, this whole system depends on reciprocity between states, and Minnesota is currently the only holdout uh, that, that isn't reciprocating. I would also add that this bill costs nothing to the state, um, and in fact, not passing it uh, is an opportunity cost for many uh, grants that we could have. Um, you know, and then lastly, uh, in response to the prior testimony, if we were to obtain consent to share the data, this data set simply would not be complete. It's not the way it's done anywhere in any other state or for that matter, developed nation. So uh, I urge you to pass this. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, all right, um, so um, and if, is Chair, there anyone else? Yeah. Chair, may I just add that? Yeah, um, just hold on one moment. Let me just see if there's anyone else in the sure. audience who'd like to testify, and then I'll go back to you, Representative Carroll. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify on the bill? Okay, go ahead, Representative Carroll. I was just gonna say in response to some of the concerns that, that there's um, specific provision that the, in here that the data is considered to be private and any violation of disclosing that is a crime, a misdemeanor. So that provides us some safeguards as well, additional safeguards. Okay, and Representative Carroll, I think you're maybe re referring to line 1.17 and 1.18, where it has this addition, and this was modified by the A1, and now it says research protections for patients must be consistent with section 13.04 sub 2 and Code of Federal Regulations, Title 45, Part 46. I know that 13.04 is our privacy section in law. Yep, and the Data Practices Act, correct. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Okay, all right. Very good, thank you for that. Um, so we'll go to member discussion. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Carroll. I'm wondering if you, I, and I apologize, this is this bill is referencing a lot of other sections of statute, some of which I've been able to um, review and others that I have not. And I appreciate the discussion uh, about um, data privacy. That's where my mind went with this as well. And I am wondering, so under the current, under, under current statute, um, this, this, the interviewing of patients um, can only be done after the consent of an attending physician. Now it can be done just after notifying a physician. Um, is there any initial consent? And like I said, I apologize, I haven't been able to review all of these statutes. Um, is there any initial consent given by patients for their data to be shared to begin with? Um, Representative Carroll. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I don't want to step on it, so I'm going to phone a friend and see if the department's still here. Yep. Right. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck out upon me. Yes. Yeah. And is it Mr. Side? How do you spell your name? I'm sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is uh, Jay Desai. D, D is in David. Um, Decide. Decide. Yep. D E S A I. Okay. Thank you. And um, currently, as um, Dr. Spector had also uh, mentioned, for cancer registries and cancer you know, reporting systems throughout the country, um, the data gets reported into those uh, systems from different health systems and clinic settings. They do not require patient consent. Uh, there was, uh, when we were setting up in Minnesota back in 1988, the cancer reporting system, uh, there was a year-long process that engaged numerous stakeholders to weigh the risks and benefits of um, obtaining consent as part of having a cancer reporting system. And at that time, and I don't think it's changed, uh, the consensus was uh, unanimous that the benefit was well worth the potential risk of uh, data privacy breach. And also, as Dr. Spector uh, noted, um, so we've been running for over 40 years. There has never been a data privacy breach uh, with the Minnesota cancer reporting system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative New Brindley, any follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that. Um, I, that is concerning because this does change things because right now there is at least a level of, um, you know, requiring physician <laughs> consent at least gives a an additional level of privacy because right now that means that patients have no privacy. Um, their data is given, I, I, I don't know if it's with or without their knowledge, but it's given to the registry and it's personal data, their names, personal identifiers, and, and at least right now with the consent rather than the notification, there is some level, um, uh, there's, there's at least some wall there, and, and I assume then that that also means um, that this transfer of data will also not require any consent. And while it looks like in um, paragraph B of subdivision two, they, they will not be allowed to give those identifiers to national groups, they'll be able to give those identifiers to other states. Um, and frankly, I can imagine that there would be a scenario right now where people would come to Minnesota because that wasn't the case. Um, and I, I understand that we're one of just 49 states, but I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. Sometimes it's good to be an outlier. Um, and I understand the issue. My husband had, had ALS. There was a national ALS registry. It was completely opt-in and people opted in. We, we did that. Um, and the, the complete lack of consent on the part of the patient is is really concerning to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative New Brindley. Uh, Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and recalling testimony on this issue in past years, uh, the big concern study-wise was the fact that you need to be able to get rid of duplications and have a fuller record and because mail has millions of uh, visitors and many of them are from other states, which means they pr generally have had some treatment and probably some information in your records, um, there was a big concern that if we gave only the de-identified data, uh, then there would be uh, duplications. So am I interpreting correctly in that the only identified data is for residents of other states that are already cooperating, which means that their uh, other records are there. Um, is it just for uh, deduplication? Uh, if you can, you know, bring me up to speed because of the previous debate was, that was a main concern. Mr. Desai, maybe that's for you. Uh, yes, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, there are several reasons for why we, try, we need identifiable information and deduplication is certainly one of them. 
We often get reports um, from the same cancer cases from multiple different locations, different sites, pathology reports, medical records. And so we need to be able to consolidate that so that we know that it's the same person for the same kind of cancer. Um, and so to increase the accuracy of the information that we have. So that's what happens currently with Minnesota residents in Minnesota. Um, and uh, in terms of the sharing with other states, it would be for the same reason, so that they can also deduplicate within their own systems. And part of the requirement of that sharing is that those other states must still also follow our state statutes around data privacy when they receive that data. Um, so those are still in place. So the, the, the safety protocols that we have here would have to be maintained by those other registries as well. Um, and then just to, to follow up one more piece, in terms of the issue of consent, when we're talking about um, giving people the opportunity to know if there's research opportunities, that's what this language is about. So it's not about the main collection of the information or sharing of it, it's about specifically if there are opportunities around epidemiologic investigations or research, there's a process that you have to go through. For that study to first even be brought forward to a patient, it has to meet the criteria of going through an IRB or and through a, a separate peer review committee that's been established here uh, in the Department of Health to make sure that the study is appropriate, that data privacy concerns are met, human subjects concerns are met, and that's the first piece. Then it goes to talking to the provider and getting their consent uh, before it goes to the patient. And so what we were talking about here is saying that we will still let the provider know, but we will let the patient um, hear it also directly. Yeah, thank you. It always struck me that it's a little paternalistic, perhaps, if that's the right word, to go to the ask the provider for their consent first. There may have been good reasons for it back in yeah. 1988 when this first started, but um, those have changed over time as our record keeping and communication has changed. Yeah, thank you very much. Representative Kwan, follow uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so for clarification, we share, this bill is to make so that we can share identified information to the state of residence of patients treated in Minnesota but are resident in other states. We are not sharing identified information of Minnesotans. We are sharing de-identified information of Minnesotans in other states in order to help us uh, get rid of duplication are sharing with us I, I, you know, regular identified information so we can clean ours. Is that the correct interpretation of what you were stating? Yes, that's, yeah. yes that's, the, that's one part of it. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, other states also with their registries, when they report nationally to a national database that Dr. Spector and others use, that's also de-identified from their states when it goes up to, it goes to the CDC or these national organizations. Um, and what we need is, you know, when we have snowbirds who are going to Arizona or Florida or Texas and get diagnosed with cancer down there, we would like to be able to have their records, right? When we have people who are going across the border or vice versa, people from Wisconsin coming to Minnesota and getting diagnosed, they would like to have that accurate cancer information for their own states so that they can have appropriate numbers if they need to do certain kinds of investigations around cancer concerns, they have the complete data set to be able to, to do that and do it well. And, that, and that it reciprocates back to us. Okay, Representative Kwam. Okay, um, and you mentioned the snowbirds, if they are um, going to Arizona, there's a Mayo facility there, if they're going to uh, um, Florida, there's a Mayo facility. And since both facilities have the EPIC and they're tied together, um, and they're patients of, of Mayo, is that data uh, segregated? I thought that data was totally accessible at any of the Mayo sites for regular uh, medical access and consultation. Mr. Desai. Uh, Mayo is not required to uh, report to us if they've diagnosed uh, somebody in Florida or, or Arizona. But you know, th this also, that's Mayo, right? That's one very unique system, but people are getting diagnosed with a variety of different health systems, you know, throughout the U.S. and it's being able to capture that information. Uh, Madam Chair, the, okay. the actual question I asked was, 
that, you know, because people are concerned about data privacy, but within the Mayo system, which is located in multiple states, mm -hmm. they're using the same EPIC system and it's stored by, you know, your ID for Mayo. That's accessible to any Mayo facility yeah. for utilization for medical. Yeah. So there is um, that data, you know, can be residing in several states. But I think what this is saying is the only identified information shared with other states is for their residents and that when we share Minnesota resident information outside of the state, it is de-identified. And, and I think that's how it's yeah. taken care of it. Thank right. you. Thank you, Representative Crum. And I see Mr. Desai is saying yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I just want to take this moment to point out to members there are four letters in your packet supporting the bill. And even though we don't have a big parade of testifiers tonight, um, there are a number of organizations supporting this. Um, Representative Elkins. Just a uh, clarification. So in, in subdivision two, it talks about personal identifiers in par subparagraph A and direct identifiers in paragraph B. Are the personal identifiers in the first paragraph pseudonymous? Yes. Uh, Mr. Desai. Yes, the personal identifiers, direct identifiers, they're used synonymously. Yes. They're synonymous, yeah. pseudonymous. So about. this is, you, it, basically this means it's a, an, the, the record has a, an identifier, but you can't use that identifier to identify the person. So. Mr. Desai? Yes. That's yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, um, so so uh, seeing no other discussion, Representative Carroll is going to renew his motion that House Bill 1329, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary Committee where they will have the privacy discussion all over again. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion prevails and the bill is on its way. Thank you very much, Representative Carroll, and thank you, testifiers. Okay, um, House File 1356, Representative Jordan. And, yeah, and so um, Representative Jordan is here with a couple of lead related bills, and I just want to remind the committee that we heard these bills informationally, so hopefully we've had a lot of our questions answered. But we now do have the bills before us. And so uh, since she's not on the committee, I'm going to move House File 1356 to be laid over for possible inclusion. And there is an A1 amendment. And um, I assume you want to get the bill in the proper shape, Representative Jordan. So I will move the A1 amendment to be able to do that. And then we'll discuss it as amended. So. All in favor of adoption of the A1, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So Representative Jordan, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. House file 1356 is nothing but definitions. This is necessary to better facilitate replacing lead infrastructure in Minnesota. Um, and MDH is on hand to go into more detail if uh, members want, but that's, that's the bill in a nutshell. Okay. So um, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on the bill? All right, not seeing anyone. So we are open for member discussion or questions. Are there, is there any discussion to the bill as amended? All right, I'm not seeing anything. So with that, Representative Jordan, House File 1356, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. We will move to your other bill. So um, next is House File 1447. And uh, on behalf of Representative Jordan, I will move that House File 1447 be laid over for possible inclusion. And let's see. It looks like we also have an amendment on that one, yes? We have the A1 amendment. Um, so 
let's adopt the A1 amendment. All in favor of adoption, oh, I will move it. And all in favor of adoption of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. So, Representative Jordan, to your bill as amended. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, committee members, for letting me come back to remind you that no amount of uh, exposure to lead is safe. Um, and with that, I will present my second lead bill, which is a little more complicated than the last one, but it's House File 1447, which is an agency bill that would enable MDH to develop rules consistent with the federal renovate, repair, and paint, or RRP rule. This proposal makes a number of policy changes that were discovered in the course of developing MDH's RRP rule. The first change addresses differences between the lead abatement and RRP rule de minimis thresholds. Currently, we're not in compliance with federal standards here, and this change will alleviate confusion among certified lead firms submitting lead hazard reduction notifications to the department. The second part of the proposal addresses the primary intent issue with regard to lead hazard reduction and renovation work in residencies and child occupied facilities. To accomplish this, we move back to the original lead law language from pre-2009 regarding primary in intent and place it under the revised definition of lead hazard reduction. And then the third part of the re proposal um, revises the definition of a certified renovation firm so that it is aligned with the federal RRP standard. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'm here, and so is MDH to answer technical questions about House File uh, 1447. Okay, thank you very much, Representative Jordan. And um, so I would just ask the, your partner there, did you want to say anything or you just want to uh, respond to questions? Madam Chair members, um, Jackie Kavanaugh from the Department of Health, and I am here to answer any questions um, about the bill. Um, I also have um, our lead program supervisor, Bruce Lang, with me as well. Right. Um, again, this bill is a technical housekeeping bill to um, correct some erroneous statutory provisions that need to be aligned with um, EPA's federal regulations so that the department can go ahead and um, adopt rules that we are required to adopt. Okay, great. And could you just give me your name again? I didn't quite catch it. Sure. It's Jackie Kavanaugh. 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 Okay, thank you. All right, very good. So thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to testify on the bill? All right, not seeing anyone. So uh, members, any discussion to the bill? They're in my district. Yeah. Awful quiet, okay. Well, that's very good. Uh, so thank you. So um, any closing words, Representative Jordan? Blood is bad, the bills are good. I hope you consider them in your omnibus, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. So with that, House File 1447, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you, and thank you to Ms. Kavanaugh and other support. Okay, um, next is Representative Quam, House File 1491. And Representative Quam, would you want to move that House File 1492, oh wait, is it 1490, yes, 91, sorry, 1491 be laid over for possible inclusion? I would so move, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And I don't see an amendment to this one. So Representative Quam, go ahead and introduce your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's fairly straightforward. It's adding five positions to the board and it is making changes or clarifications to three of the existing positions. Um, and I would like the uh, testifier to clarify because we, I have received questions. Uh, line 1.20 and 1.21, um, the new language has or other oral health professional if a dentist is not available to participate. My understanding is that for about two years there hasn't been a dentist, but several dentists have applied and some people are uh, wondering why they haven't been placed on the committee and what defines not available to participate. 
Okay, so, all right, thank you, Representative Quam. So um, do, do you want to introduce yourself for the record and sure. go ahead and, and say something about the bill as well? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Zora Radasevich. I'm the Director of the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care in the Minnesota Department of Health. And to that specific issue, um, the idea to add an oral health representative to the, to the committee came up from um, the Rural Health Advisory Committee's work group in 2018, which was chaired by a dentist, and they, they debated that quite a bit and recommended an oral health professional to just broaden the, the, the pool. Um, and then last year, the legislature added the dentist. And so we just wanted to broaden that a little bit more for um, to allow an oral health professional, not a dentist, to also participate on the committee. If a dentist, and we're willing to, I mean, that's fine, if a dentist isn't available. It's been, I can't speak to why it took two years to appoint a dentist. That process happens outside of our office. But a dentist was recently appointed, and today we received a letter from him saying that he has a conflict with the meeting dates and wouldn't be able to participate on those days. And so we were just looking for a little bit more flexibility for that position because everyone agrees it would be good to have oral health represented on the committee in a formal way. We'd had a dentist before through the provision that allows another health professional, um, but in this case, and they thought it would be good to always have an oral health professional. Right, okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Kwan? Thank you, Madam Chair. And since uh, in order to save time is why I brought that question up. Um, and just for clarification, the uh, dentist that was a participant uh, requested to be added. Just like there are five positions being added in this bill, and it wasn't, and that, that specific dentist has indicated in the discussions it wasn't to replace the dentist, it was to add that position. Uh, the language here would would basically be a dentist or another and I think uh, it would be good when the major bill is pulled together that there's some clarification on the process if for a couple years multiple dentists had applied and just recently one was was added um, I think there needs to be a little more clarification on this uh, just for the simple fact that if there are dentists that can serve, they would have a broader understanding of, of the full scope of the practice and there's a lot of concerns that the dental portion of our health care uh, doesn't get as much of uh, attention and so I'm just saying that there should probably be further attention later on but tonight we probably don't have the time or the uh, the background and multiple testifiers to uh, dig into that. All right, thank you, Representative Crom. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on the bill? Okay, not seeing anybody. Is there any member discussion? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> uh, and by the way, the cookies are delicious. Thank you. Um, I, I actually keyed in on that same on that same lines 1.20 and 1.21, and my concern actually, um, while it is it is questionable that there were multiple dentists who applied and were not appointed, and now we're changing the parameters. That's concerning, but also it's interesting to me that the other positions, particularly the professional positions are very specific, um, a medical doctor or do doctor of osteopathic medicine. And in fact, we're changing the language, a mid-level practitioner to a more specific advanced practiced professional, um, registered nurse or LPN. With these other with these other professional um, positions, they are very specific and it feels like we're actually moving backwards on the dentist, whereas like I said, uh, it, for the mid-level practitioner, we're actually moving forward and professionalizing that more in indicating that it's an advanced practice professional. So um, I, I echo those thoughts, Representative Kwam, that I hope that we look at that moving forward. It seems that um, if, if there are dentists who are applying for that position, that we should ensure that maybe if nothing else, that they would be given priority um, 
over over someone else um, applying for that position. It, it seems that there should at least by, be a priority level at minimum. Um, but like I said, it just seems like we're moving backwards in that one and, and forwards in other provisions. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Radosevich, did you want to respond? Um, Madam Chair, if I could just clarify my earlier remarks. The, the, the dentist wasn't a requirement until last year and when dentists, so up until 20, 2020, I think, the dentists did serve on the committee and then in the next round of appointments, there were quite a few in that other health professions. And so it was very competitive and another profession was appointed. Um, and in this case, the, the advanced practice professional is, is more a term that is more, um, that is preferable to advanced practice professionals. So it's nursing, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants. Right, and Ms. Radosevich, I was just asking uh, staff to, uh, my understanding is that on line 2.1, it's really the same thing, it's just a more modernized term. Correct. Correct, Representative New Brindley? Well, that's what I was gonna ask. Is there a definition in statute of a oral health professional? Well, I was just mentioning uh, the middle level as opposed to advanced practice, but um, I don't know if maybe that would be a question for Ms. Clarkfist if there's a definition in statute for that. Um, Madam Chair and Representative New Brindley, not for this um, section, there isn't. That would be something that would be up to the um, health department and the appointing authority. Thank you, Madam. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so once again, I would just reiterate that point that it seems like we're moving a little bit backwards than forwards. We're, we're clarifying things better according to current vernacular on line 2.1, but we're moving backwards to a sort of an undefined uh, categorization on 1.20. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, other discussion to the bill. Okay, Representative Bonner. Thank you, Chair Liedling, and thank you, Representative Quam. And mine is actually maybe just a minor one. I actually, you know, I, I, I certainly understand the concern on, on lines 120 and 21, and, and of course, yes, line 2.1, as Chair Liedling said, they're pretty much the same thing. I do appreciate that you added a, a member of a tribal nation um, and, and some other items here. The, the one question that I had was that we changed the board from a 16 member, um, advisory committee, excuse me, to a 21 member committee. And, and I guess my only question, because I do not see it in the packet, is, um, is there a stipend associated with this group? And would that need a fiscal note? Ms. Radosevich. Madam Chair, uh, and Representative Bonner, no, there is no stipend attached. I think oh. a few get, um, reimbursement for mileage, but we've been meeting remotely for a couple of years. Thank you. Okay. All right, and I, I, so I have to say, I don't find 1.20 and 1.21 adding the um, oral health professional, I don't find that troubling at all. I, I think it says, or other oral health professional, if a dentist is not available to participate. So clearly the dentist is being preferred there and I, I do think it, to me, as I read it, it just gives flexibility because I, I do agree with Representative Kwam. I mean, it's, you know, rural uh, dentistry and lack thereof is a super important problem that we all want to deal with. And so I think having someone there, if a dentist isn't available, having someone who can represent provision of care in rural parts of Minnesota is, would be very important. So I, I think it's good to be adding that uh, flexibility, frankly, but maybe that's just me. But anything else? Um, I don't have any other members on the list. Representative Kwam? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, to uh, Representative Bonner's question, uh, the uh, bill has on line 2.2 uh, references chapter 15.059, but states that members do not receive a per diem compensation. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Kwam. Uh, I was the author of the provision that brought uh, the dentist in as a named person, as a member of the board. And 
from my point of view, I think that there is maybe some process work to think about in terms of recruitment and visibility of the opportunity uh, so that, because if you're not used to being included, you're not going to be looking for that opportunity. And I think the points about the understanding of the business aspects of providing care, of broadening um, market growth and penetration into different parts of the state really does belong with the, the owner and the leader of the business. Um, to the extent that the, it's purely about care, um, I think we could broaden it, but I think to be able to solve the very challenging problems that we're seeing in rural um, dental care. I think it should be the dentist, and I would prefer to keep it as is um, in maybe a future um, round and be thinking about how do we um, identify and encourage dentists to participate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any closing comment, Representative Quam? Thank you, Madam Chair. And you know, this was recently dropped. Uh, I did query because I thought, well, maybe there's a shortage of dentists and they weren't applying. Uh, had some conversations, and I just um, think that we probably should have uh, over the weeks maybe see if there's some clarification or improvement. But uh, I think the intent of the action that adding the additional five uh, broadens definitely some perspective. Um, and that was the only thing, and that's why I brought it up, just so the members would be aware. And when this comes up, if it's included, uh, we'll have better information. Okay, thank you very much, Representative Quam. So with that, House File 1491 is laid over for possible inclusion. Okay, um, next is Representative Hemmingson Yeager and House File 1679. So while she's coming up, um, the motion there is Representative Hemmingson Yeager's motion would be for House File 1679 to be laid over for possible inclusion. And there is an A1 amendment, which I assume we should adopt right now? Yes, please. Okay, so um, she is moving the A1 author's amendment. All in favor of adoption of the A1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. So to your bill as amended, Representative Hem Hemmingson Yeager. Thank you. Well, I am here uh, presenting House File 1679. Uh, it's an MDH bill that basically uh, kind of removes um, hospital physical environment requirements and instead references um, at the bottom of page one, this guidelines institute for guidelines for design and construction of hospitals. Um, hospital licensure for physical environment requirements were written around 1955. Um, adopting these to replace those requirements um, is kind of just updating everything. Architects are already designing to this and so basically we're just adopting kind of um, and codifying current practice. Okay. So kind of long and short of it. All right. Very good. Um, so um, did your partner want to testify or, or just answer questions? Yes, yes. Okay, Okay. please go ahead and give, give us your name and, and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bob Daler, last name is spelled D-E-H-L-E-R. I'm the manager of the engineering section in the health regulation division at the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, one of the many jobs the engineers in our section do is to review construction plans and inspect construction uh, for all licensed hospitals in the state of Minnesota. So this bill proposes to adopt the 2022 edition of the Facility Guidelines Institute, what we commonly refer to as the FGI, the guidelines for design and construction of hospitals as the physical environment requirements for all licensed hospitals in the state. The proposal also rescinds specific physical environment requirements in Minnesota rules, chapters 4640 and 4645. The FGI guidelines are a are minimum standard consensus document that, that really aids in the design and construction of hospitals. The guidelines were written for states to adopt and to enforce, so all hospitals follow a minimum standard of that design and construction. And these standards are already being used as the design standard by healthcare designers throughout the state. 
and the bill, as we mentioned earlier, essentially codifies what, what's currently being done in Minnesota. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you have today, and thanks for having me. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on the bill? Please come down. And we'll, we'll need to make space for her to come and sit at the table. Um, Madam Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Mary Krinke and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. I just want to go on record and say we are fine with this bill, we're good with this bill. We've been working with the department and I would just like to add one point that we would like potentially to have language that says if there's any construction projects that have already been commenced that they would be under perhaps the old guidelines rather than necessarily the new ones that are being adopted. I don't know if this is disruptive to any of the projects that are in the that are already taking place. So, but we are good with the language and just wanted to share that for the record. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. I don't know if this has an effective date in it. Um, and if the effective date might take care of that or not, but thank you for flagging that for us. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Okay, not seeing anyone, so uh, member, Questions or discussion? Okay, so um, any final comment, Representative Hemmings and Yeager? Um, just to clarify, thank you again for listening. Um, there's some effective dates of August 1st kind of peppered in um, throughout the bill language, so just to draw your attention to that. Okay, and I don't know if, um, but we're, we're laying the bill over, and I'm sure that. You know, um, Mr. Daler, if you uh, maybe could talk to Ms. Crinky and, you know, we'll see if, see if anything's needed before we um, put together our omnibus. Okay? Great. So with that, uh, House File 1, 1679, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you very much. And the next one is... Also, Representative Hemmings and Yeager, so it's House File 2038. And so Representative Hemmings and Yeager's motion is again to have House File 2038 be laid over for possible inclusion. And there are a couple of authors' amendments on this one. And so Representative Hemmings and Yeager, did you want to, how do you want to handle it? Do we want to put, just put both of these on the bill or are they alternative or what? Yes, please. So um, the A1 is kind of um, just a cleanup, I think, kind of looking at it, kind of just got overzealous with adding prescription in and then actually went through and took out the superfluous words of prescription. Um, and then the A2-1 is uh, simplifying the definition and statute to conform with that of the federal definition. So in the event the federal definition changes, we don't have to come back here to change the Minnesota. It just kind of okay. automatically goes. So let's, um, let's do them one at a time. Okay. So, um, so uh, do you want to move the A1 first then? Yes, please. Okay. And you, you already kind of described it that it's clean up. Um, so let's adopt that one. So all in favor of adoption of the A1, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion prevails. So the A1 is adopted. And then the um, A2-1, so um, Representative Hemison Yeager is moving adoption of the A2-1 author's amendment. Um, any discussion to that amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the A2-1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails, and that one is adopted. So, to your bill as amended. Great. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your patience in the multiple amendments. I appreciate it. Um, this is another agency bill. Uh, this one specifically references regulating um, prescription hearing aids. Um, it's fairly technical. Um, I have my best friend here to help with any questions. Um, but basically, it's just conforming state law to the new federal regulations that prohibit the state from regulating over-the-counter uh, hearing aids. So 
Um, I will also note that we are working um, with members of the Minnesota Academy of Audiology. They support that. They support this bill as well. Um, just kind of working on there's one sentence line 2.1 to 2.2 that we're just working on some things um, with the department and the academy to make sure that it's clear for everybody with the intent. All right, very good. So welcome to the committee. Did you want to testify also? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. All right, please just tell us your name and go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Rick Michaels. My last name is spelled M-I-C-H-A-L-S and I'm the State Operations Manager with the Health Regulation Division of the Minnesota Department of Health. I work with licensing and enforcement for state regulated providers. Okay, please go ahead and tell us about the bill. Uh, so just some background on this uh, proposal. The Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services adopted new rules creating a new category for over-the-counter hearing aids uh, that are intended to address perceived mild to moderate hearing loss in adults 18 years of age or older. As part of these changes, the FDA prohibits states from requiring over-the-counter hearing aids for adult use to be prescribed or dispensed by state-certified hearing instrument dispensers or licensed audiologists. This proposal seeks to update Minnesota statutes to conform with the new federal rules and definitions regarding hearing aids. Specifically, this proposal seeks to respond to the federal law excluding over-the-counter hearing aid sales from hearing instrument dispenser and audiologist licensing requirements. Uh, additionally, the proposal would amend the definition of hearing aid and hearing instrument to conform with the new federal definition. Mr. Michael, ironically, it's very hard to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so we need, we have very bad microphones in here. We just really need to speak closer okay. to it. Uh, additionally, um, this proposal would add other necessary definitions to various sections for over-the-counter hearing aid, prescription hearing aid, rebuilt hearing aid, used hearing aid, and bona fide evaluation. The proposal would add the term prescription before all references to hearing aid in various sections, with the exception of references to the title hearing aid dispenser or dispenser of hearing aids, um, as noted in the referenced amendment. Um, the proposal would delete references to repealed federal authorities and replace with new ones established by the federal rule. Consumers can still choose to go to an audiologist or hearing instrument dispenser to get prescription hearing aids or to get a customized fit for their hearing aids. Uh, they just cannot be required to go to one of these providers by state statute for over-the-counter hearing aids. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so, did everyone hear that? <laughs> I guess the jokes just write themselves here, right? <laughs> With our bad microphones in this room. But, um, so, uh, great. So, is there anyone else in the room who would like to testify on the bill? Okay, not seeing anybody. Is there any member discussion? Madam Chair? Could I yes, please? Representative Smith. Or uh, Madam Comedian. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is just a question, in, in ta I'm on the Taxes Committee and we talk a lot about conformity there. Um, this is the first time I've heard it serving on the Health Committee. I'm just curious, uh, is it necessary to pass this this bill for the F the new FDA and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services new rules to be adopted in Minnesota. Is this something we're doing for ease? I mean, I would think that the federal guidelines would supersede what we have at the state level, but I I'm just curious. This is I'm not for or against. Uh, I'm just curious why we have to conform specifically to this. Mr. Michaels, can you address that? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, so prior to this uh, new federal rule. Um, we were able to regulate both over the, what, what's now defined as over-the-counter hearing aids and prescription hearing aids. So um, to, to clarify what's being regulated and where licensure certification is required, um, we'd like to propose these uh, updates to the statute. Representative Hemings Hemings and Yeager. Yeah, I can also speak from my experience in other um, state agencies that this is very common when the federal um, laws change. We have to look at our laws too to make sure that they're they're not conflicting with each other. Representative Smith. Yeah, okay. All right. Any other questions or discussion? All right. Not seeing any. So uh, rep so. Um, House file 2038 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you very much, Mr. Michaels and Representative Hemmings and Yeager. Thank you. So you are off the hook. So um, I'm gonna now hand over the um, gavel for a little bit 
to Ch Vice Chair Bierman. Yeah. Which one are we doing first? Which one? Twenty. All right, Madam Chair, would you like to move your bill? I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would move that House File 2050 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I have the A1 amendment, which I would like to move to get the bill in the shape in which I'd like to have it discussed. All right. I uh, have a motion to move the A1 amendment to put the bill in the order that you would like it. Would you like to tell us about the amendment? Okay, so the amendment, and I actually, I, I, uh, what I think the amendment is doing is, uh, and what my intent is, is to remove subdivision two on, on the last page, and just, um, and I guess I should just confirm with um, this Clark Fist, that's what it's doing, because it, the drafting of it was a little confusing to me, but I, I assumed that, that was what it was intended to do, Ms. Clark Fist. Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling, that's correct. It removes the new language from subdivision two. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any discussion from members? Uh, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, it removes the new language, but it also uh, eliminates the language that was struck as well. So it just it just remains current language. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative New Brindley, with this amendment, there would be nothing in subdivision Great. two. It's completely gone. All right. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, the the uh, bill is in the order that you wish it to be in and you may proceed please. All right, thank you very much and um, Mr. Chair and committee and so my understanding is this is of course another um, Department of Health bill and my understanding of what this is doing is just really clean up and reorganizing the statute and I have my MDH partner here to explain anything further if there are other questions and, and maybe you'd like to go ahead and, and do that. Thank you, my name is Molly Crawford. I'm the state registrar for the Office of Vital Records at the Minnesota Department of Health. This uh, bill does exactly what the chairperson has said. It cleans up two existing statutes so that they use modern terminology and we are eliminating obsolete processes related to fetal death reporting. Back when the law was passed to create a certificate of birth resulting in stillbirth, fetal death reports were received by the Department of Health. A parent needed to request that a report be transitioned to a record in order for us to issue a certificate to the parents to recognize the existence of the stillbirth. Over time, um, fetal death records transitioned as our technology changed and there is no need to request that a fetal death that's been reported become a record. In addition, the certificates of birth resulting in stillbirth back when they were created were used for a commemorative purpose. It's important now that they're issued from a record so that they have all of the security that a birth and a death record would have. All right, thank you. Very much. Um, we can um, move to member questions. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I apologize, I missed the name of the testifier. Molly Crawford. Thank you, uh, Ms. Crawford. Um, I was uh, scanning the language and um, does, does this also affect, as 
as I look, maybe it only affects the delayed registration, but does it also affect a death certificate? Is, is, is a death certificate issued as well? Are both issued then? Um, Vice Chair, may I? Yes. yes. Um, there's a lot of confusion uh, about fetal deaths. Fetal deaths are stillbirths. Mm -hmm. They're not a live birth. A death certificate is issued for a person who was born alive. And so when a family experiences a fetal death, a loss, the only certificate that's available to them is their certificate of birth resulting in stillbirth. There is no death certificate. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Any other questions? Actually, can I follow up? Absolutely. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Um, just as a follow-up then, um, so they, they can receive a, just a copy of, of the fetal death record, which is just not an, an official, like a birth certificate would have, like you said, those security measures, and, but there is a fetal death record that they could request. Vice Chair, yes, there is. Um, so certificates, um, a birth certificate, a death certificate, a fetal death, record um, when it's issued as a certificate of birth resulting in stillbirth contains a subset of the data that exists in the vital record. And so yes, a mother, the person who delivered the stillbirth is eligible to get a uh, transcript or fetal death report, which would include all of the private health data about her pregnancy, the delivery, um, as well as the demographic and civil registration information that would be printed on the certificate. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. F further questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Any other comments, questions from members? All right, uh, final word, Chair Liebling. Um, I don't think I really need to say anything more. Very good. Uh, we will, lay, the bill will be, as amended, will be laid over and we will move to the next bill. Thank you. That is House File 2052. And uh, there is also again an author's amendment, the A2. Would you like to move your author's amendment? Right, so Mr. Chair, so I would move that House File 2052 be uh, recommended, uh, laid over for possible inclusion, and then I would like to move the A2-1 amendment, which is just an author's amendment to get the bill in the proper form. And would, Representative Liebling, would you like to tell us about the amendment? Not really, Not I would really. just like to adopt it. Just to adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right, so, so all those in favor? Oh, well, I suppose we need discussion. Uh, Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I wish to commend the honesty of the author. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Representative Quam. All right, seeing no more discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Seeing none, the A2 is laid over. The bill is in the shape. Oh, okay. The amendment is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the bill is in the shape you would like it to be in. Representative Liebling, uh, would you like to tell us about the bill? All right. Thank you, members. This is another bill from the Department of Health, and I'm going to turn to my assistant here. I'm her assistant, really, but uh, and let her explain the bill. All right, if you would introduce yourself for the committee, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Representatives. My name is Daphne Pons, P-O-N-D-S. I am an Interim Executive Operations Manager in the Health Regulation Division at the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, and my management is currently over the home care program. This proposal changes the surveying requirements to more closely mirror the language in assisted living licensing statutes, which requires MDH to follow up only on level three and level four violations where harm occurred or has significant potential to occur. All other follow-up is at MDH's discretion. 
This proposal removes statutory language mandating MDH follow-up on all home care level one and level two widespread licensing violations. MDH believes eliminating these prescriptive requirements will benefit home care providers and the clients they serve by expediting the survey process, which will allow providers more time to focus on client care rather than administrative survey, survey processes that provide little to no direct benefit to the clients. By decreasing department time spent on low-risk administrative violations, the department can focus staff hours on new initial surveys to identify high-risk health and safety issues. This proposal streamlines the survey home care process for surveys and reflects a decade of lessons learned utilizing this survey model. Likewise, this proposal removes some of the prescriptive statutory language around the survey exit conference. The department does intend to utilize the exit conference to communicate survey findings to home care providers while adding flexibility to the exit process. I would also note follow-up follow -up surveys are not mentioned in assisted living statutes and are left to the discretion of the department. The department appreciate, appreciate your consideration of this proposal and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Bonds. Um, I'll ask if anybody else in the public wants to testify on the bill. I don't see any, so we'll move to uh, member discussion and questions. Seeing none, um, final words? Representative Liebling? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It sounds to me like uh, the department is doing a little less regulating, which I think some members probably will appreciate. So, I mean, it sounds like we're, um, kind of uh, right-sizing what's going on here uh, in terms of, of the um, regulation of these providers. So um, I would ask that the bill be laid over. Very good. Representative Liebling, we will uh, lay the bill over. Um, <clears throat> as amended, all those in favor? No, don't have to vote. Oh, don't need to vote. Just oh, that's right. We're laid, just so the bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. The bill is laid over for possible inclusion, and we thank you for your testimony. Next, we have House File 2231, Representative Perryman. And uh, Representative Perryman's motion is that House File 2231 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I don't think there's an amendment on this one. Am I correct? There is not, Madam Chair. All right, very good. So Representative Perryman, please uh, go ahead and present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, House file, excuse me, House file 2231, uh, Madam Chair and members, is a Minnesota Department of Health policy proposal to make minor changes to the nursing home change of ownership. This bill provides a technical clarification to the nursing home change of ownership requirements by updating one section, just one section, of the recently passed nursing home change of ownership statutes with proposed assistant living licensures, exact same language, and implementation efforts. Members, this is an easy technical clarification and since we're getting to the end of the night you'll you'll appreciate this very simple technical clarification but the Minnesota Department of Health is on hand in case you have questions all right thank you representative Perryman so did you wish to testify at all or, or? Um, yes I would okay please go ahead state your name and go ahead hi thank you for having me my name is Shalay Dietrich d-i-e-t-r-i-c-h I am the Federal Operations Manager at the Minnesota Department of Health, the Health Regulation Division, and I oversee federal licensing and enforcement. So as it was mentioned, this is a housekeeping change that clarifies that a nursing facility can be owned by one or multiple owners. So this will ensure that the correct entity is listed as a licensee and will help MDH to identify if the license holds 
other licenses, res registrations, or certifications. It also allows MDH to track and verify ownerships to help with consumer protection. The current application is already gathering information about who the owners are because applicants can voluntarily name multiple owners. This proposal will not hold up the application process. MDH already knows there are multiple owners and will clarify language on the application to clear up any confusion. Also, MDH will be constantly gathering all ownership information. And please all let right. me know if there's any questions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, is there anyone else who would like to testify on the bill? Okay, not seeing anyone. Are there member questions or discussion? Okay, so um, Representative Perryman, is this the first bill you presented or have you presented in other committees? This is my first bill, Madam Chair. Very good, okay. Well, thank you very much for carrying this bill. Um, so I would just comment that I think this is, even though it's a small bill, I think this is a really important issue. And I do appreciate your carrying it because um, obviously knowing who owns a nursing home is really important for consumer protection. And uh, it's really important that we have that information. And, and um, anyway, so very much appreciated. Um, anybody else on the committee want to comment? Uh, Representative Carroll? Thank you, Madam. Madam Chair, I'm glad you pointed out uh, Representative Perryman's uh, maiden voyage, inaugural visit here. <laughs> Let me join you in saying I thought she did an outstanding job. <laughs> She's one Thanks. of my favorite classmates. All right. With all due respect to the ones at the table. Okay. Thank you, Representative. It makes my night a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Please, so uh, a note for the trainers that they neglected the uh, first bill uh, author is supposed to uh, do something for the committee in which is uh, you know, listening to their bill. Okay, okay. Uh, so I, I yeah. want to note for the record that we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to be clear, it is not a, it is, uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't do it. She's doing just great and. Uh, so, so we only fine. accept. Yeah. Oh. Madam Chair, um, treats from departments? <laughs> we, we could accept them, but we, we never ever require or suggest that anything like that is required. <laughs> Madam Chair, so, you covered me tonight with your cookies. I, that's my full intention, <laughs> Representative Perryman. So with that, House File 2231 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then we have another one, which is House File 2232. So Representative Perryman's motion here is again that it be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus. And Representative Perryman, once again, I don't think there is a... Madam Chair, oh, there, there is, is an, an amendment. There is an amendment, A1. All right, did you want to adopt that right now? Yes, please. All right, so Representative Perryman is moving the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape in which she would like to have it discussed. All in favor, adoption of the A1, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion prevails and the A1 is adopted. So to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House file 2232, um, I move and um, members, it is an M MDH proposal that makes technical modifications to the nursing home moratorium process. This bill would update several subdivisions within the nursing home moratorium process statute to correct misalignment with new DHS payment reimbursement functions for moratorium projects. This is a joint proposal which, with DHS and its nursing facility rates and policy unit. Members, this is another straightforward bill, making it easy at the end of the night, but the department is on hand to help answer any of your questions. All right, thank you, Representative Perryman. And I see the cookies are going around again here. <laughs> so, um, Representative, uh, let's see, did your testifiers want to, did you want to give testimony on this one? So actually, as, as I mentioned before, I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health. We work very, very closely with Minnesota Department of Human Services. So I'm actually gonna let Kim okay. take over here. That's so thank you. terrific, thank you. Welcome to the committee and just give us your name and go ahead and Tell us what you can about the bill. 
Good evening. My name is Kim Brenny, and I am with the Minnesota Department of Human Services Nursing Facility Rates and Policy Division. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the changes in this bill, just to reiterate, are technical in nature. They're needed to conform with statutory changes that this legislature enacted in 2019. The changes in this bill are not intended to change the process, state costs, reimbursement, project eligibility, um, or anything else for any nursing facility. It's just that when sections of 256R um, were revised to um, implement the new fair rental value property rate system, that there were pieces in um, 144 that referred to the old cost-based property rate system that just no longer, I mean, they don't work or align with the new fair rental value system. And so um, it's just to um, fix, to technically fix some things that should have been aligned a couple of years back. All right, very good, thank you. Um, so is there anyone else who wants to testify on the bill? Not seeing anybody. Okay, so we can go to member questions and Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Perryman. This is another bill that you've done an incredible job introducing, and I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> thank you, Representative Nadeau. I'm going to give you some hard questions. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not really. Um, I think to your, to your testifiers, um, I'm not familiar with um, lines 3.4 to 3.6. Um, could you just give me a little a little background on? I, I was trying to look up statute 144A073. Can you just give me a little background on what this fair rental value property rate does and when that change originated and why we're doing this? Since this, 2009. Uh, Bren oh. Brenny, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Go ahead, please. Um, in 2019, the Minnesota legislature passed into law fair rental value. It's a new property rate system for nursing facilities. It establishes a property payment rate for them that is um, re reimbursing them for their building space based on an appraised value, so having a, like a commercial appraisal done, um, as opposed to looking at um, the, the, the previous property system, which looked at their construction costs, um, interest expense, depreciable equipment. So it's a new methodology. And um, fair rental value, um, so we have two property systems in place right now. Fair rental value is um, currently only um, available to facilities that complete a major um, a moratorium construction project after March 1st of 2020. So when they finish that construction project, Within 90 days, they have a property appraisal, and um, that property appraisal then in help um, informs what their property payment rate is um, as part of their daily rate going forward. Representative Nadeau, does that help? So, Representative Nadeau, I think part of this, uh, and I'm sure that um, uh, Lead Schumacher, or, yeah, Lead Schumacher could probably tell you a lot about this because I think he's maybe our resident on the committee expert on this whole system. A lot of this would be taking place in the Human Services Committee, not so much here, and that's why um, our testifier is with DHS, but it's kind of a, a cross-agency deal a little bit. But it's, it has to do with the, the, um, the way we reimburse nursing homes, the way we pay for nursing home care in the state, and it's a pretty complicated system um, and value-based reimbursement, and it has these different buckets of reimbursement, uh, and one of them is a property piece based on, um, as she was explaining, the, uh, the fair market value, and so, you know, does that, does that help or make it worse? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. No, it, it, it makes me realize I need to talk to my, my uh, lead on the committee a little bit, but, but thank you. In, in, I mean, in conclusion, has this changed, has it, has, it reduced, has, it, has it reduced the impact on nursing facilities? Has it been a good, has it been a good change in, has it, has it been a good change? <laughs> thank you, that's all I needed. He's nodding, but I think for purposes of this bill, you know, that, that's kind of outside the bill because what the okay. bill is doing is, is updating the language to match what was already done. So I think if, if, if he said no, that would be a new bill that you'd need to be bringing in. It would come to the Human <laughs> Services Committee. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that bill, okay. Representative Schumacher. <laughs> All right, Representative New Brindley. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think my question would be for, for Ms. Brenny as well. Um, why was it not implemented until March instead of January, as was indicated in statute? Ms. Brenny. And this, those same bill lines, uh, the, the 3.5, we changed that in the amendment to March instead of January. Um, and I'm wondering why, why that is. Why was that not implemented in January as indicated in statute? Madam Chair? Ms. Brenning. Um, it, the original language, I'm just... So the original language is in session law, and I believe the original language said it was for rates, rate years effective on and after January 1st of 2020 for projects that were approved after March 1st of 2020. Since the it, this was passed in 2019, we were talking about a future rate year that was coming and now that January 1st of 2020 is already passed, we've already, we have already implemented this. Um, I'm not sure if that answers does that answer the question, question. Representative? Kind of. I just wondered if something if something happened between January 1st and March 1st that would have indicated that there would be a problem if they didn't change that language retroactively to delay it. But I guess I, it doesn't sound like maybe we really know. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. And I don't know, is this something Ms. Clark this can shed any light on? or? Madam Chair, I think um, for this committee's purposes, the important thing is that the effective dates in the bill um, match the effective dates in the 2019 law that was passed. And it refers to um, projects that were authorized after March 1st, 2020. To the, so those, okay. those dates need to be in sync. So it was, it was oh, okay, Representative New Brindley. Okay. All right. Okay, any other discussion to the bill? Okay, Representative Perryman, any closing comment you'd like to make? Um, no, not. I know we want to cut this short, but I do thank you all um, for listening to the to my two bills and passing them on. And uh, I look forward to more to present to you all, all right. and this uh, this uh, welcoming and uh, passing of all my bills. All Keep right. that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we hear them, we usually pass them. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Representative Perryman. So with that, House File 2232, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. So I thought I would just, um, that, that is it in terms of bills for the evening. I thought I would just um, give you all um, a little roadmap for a second on how we're going to handle these now. So it is, um, right now our plan is to put together a a uh, mini omnibus bill with these policy bills. So sometimes we get the department bills all in one bill. This time we got them separately. So we're gonna need to put them together. So um, sometime I think next week, we will, we will again repost them. And what we'll do is um, take one of the bills and amend the others onto it. So those of you who have authored a bill, if you have additional changes, you know, keep working with the department or listening to whoever you're working with. And, you know, if you have other changes that um, need to be made to it, we can do that in the process of putting them together as one bill. And um, the other thing I would like to say to the authors, first of all, I really appreciate that everyone who stepped up. There are other bills, by the way. I know Representative Schumacher, I think, had some that maybe didn't get here in time and we can, you know, also um, we could add those when we put together this, what we call, sometimes we call it a mini bus, a mini omnibus. So it would be just a purely policy bill with what we've heard tonight, mostly non-controversial bills, one hopes. And then, um, and so then we'll pass that out before first deadline. So it'll, it'll make first deadline. So the intention is that eventually that bill goes to the floor by itself. And then I probably will be the author of the um, um, minibus. But um, those of you who are authoring these bills, I'll be re um, really counting on you if there are questions on the floor to sort of be the expert on your bill. So, you know, do uh, 
you know, make sure you fully understand what you're carrying, and I know you all do, but, you know, sometimes, um, uh, you know, when you realize you might get a question on the floor, you maybe want to take another look at it, make sure, because I will definitely punt those questions to you should I get them if I'm carrying that minibus and it does go to the floor. So any questions about the process on that or anything? Okay. Well, thank you all. I'm glad we were able to do that. Thank you very much for and to all the testifiers, and um, thank you for the cookies, MDH. And um, so we will meet tomorrow, and we're going to take up a lot of um, prescription-related bills tomorrow during our regular time. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.